Okay, can I now ask Christine to call for the settlement and, and to make any apologies? Christine. Thanks, Chair, and good morning, members. Councillor Douglas Reid. Yeah. Councillor Jim McMahon. Yeah, Christine, thanks. Councillor John McFadgen. Here. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Here. Councillor Maureen Mackay. Present, Christine, thank you. Councillor Ian Linton. Nope. Councillor Graham Barton. Yes, yeah, thanks. I have an apology from Councillor Barry Douglas, Councillor Neil Ingram. Yes, yeah, thanks. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. Yeah. Councillor Drew Filson. Nope. Dr David Lewis. Here. Yeah. I have an apology from Harriet Johnston, Babs Mowat. I think Babs was on, she might have got kicked off. We'll just keep an eye on that. Hazel Malacotti. Yes, thanks. And Jackie Livingston. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Christine. Um, now go to the part of the, the declaration of interest. Don't know if there's anything obvious. No. Uh, okay. And then there's no, no declarations go straight to the East Desert of Performance Summary Report and uh, Colin Hastings. Colin will start us. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Members, this is the second East Desert Performance Report of the year, and it builds on the report that was presented and approved by you in September. In that earlier report, we highlighted the actual overspend as at the end of July and provided information on the projected end of year overspend across the Council should action be taken to reduce this spend and align service provision to the available financial resource. The report that I present today highlights an improving financial position, albeit there continues to be significant pressure on service budgets across the Council. It's evident that expenditure control measures that you approved in September are having the effect of reducing expenditure, although more work is needed to bring service budgets back into line. To continue to progress this, the Chief Executive and the Chief Financial Officer and myself will meet with relevant Chief Officers to go through a line-by-line -line review of service budgets to ensure that all possible intervention actions that are available are taken to enable assurance that budgets will, wherever possible, be brought back into line. At paragraph 9, we note that the total projected overspend for the Council is just over £14 million, and colleagues are compiling a range of recovery plans with the possible impact of initial proposals having the potential to reduce the projected underspend to around £12 million. Members, you will recall that at the last report, an additional recommendation was added seeking that a Council-wide recovery plan be compiled and brought before you for consideration. I'm pleased to report that work on service plans is progressing and that I anticipate that Council recovery plan will be brought before you next month for your consideration and approval. Between now and then, further significant work will take place to support colleagues to further review spend and spending priorities and to ultimately aim to bring their budgets back into balance. This will be especially important given that work will begin in earnest on the 2025-26 revenue budget. Paragraph 12 on page 5 notes that the projected outturn position for the education service and notes that the overspend has reduced since the last report, which is now anticipated to be around £7.5 million. Pounds. Members, you, will be, you are aware that this is a budget that has experienced pressures for some time, particularly in relation to the early learning and childcare service and the additional support for learning function, where we have continued to see significant overspends. However, the recent approval of the Early Learning and Child Care BBSR by Cabinet will go some way to resolving the financial pressures within that budget. Moreover, colleagues in education are working to develop options around additional support for learning transport, with these being brought before Cabinet prior to the Christmas break. It's important to note the comments made at paragraph 14, which shows that, that early potential options around the education service are being investigated and progressed at this point, totalling £2.3 million, which, if approved by Cabinet at a future date, have the potential uh, to reduce the service overspend to around £5.3 million. Members, the Chief Executive, the Chief Financial Officer and myself are working tirelessly to support service colleagues with their recovery plans, given the importance of maintaining a strong financial position for the Council. Paragraph 15 notes the significant progress made by colleagues within communities and economy, which is anticipated to end the year in a balanced budget position. 
However, it is important to note the pressures that exist within these range of services and the impact of some of the earlier options that were approved to balance the budget this year. Given the importance of these budgets, together with the substantial work that colleagues have undertaken to bring the budget back into balance, it continues to be essential that support is provided to colleagues within these service areas to help continue this important work. Members will see from paragraph 17 that approval is sought for a draw of £300,000 from the Council's Repairs and Renewals Fund to support two essential pieces of work around active travel and in relation to resurfacing work on the A71. Paragraph 18 of the report seeks approval for the extended move from HVO fuel to diesel for the Council fleet, and members will recall that earlier approval for such a move in respect of our waste collection vehicles was recently approved as part of the waste review. Within health and social care, paragraph 19 notes that the service projected to end the year around £7 million overspent, with pressures predominant relating to community care as the service continues to experience legacy issues from the pandemic. This quarter, Two financial, this quarter two financial position is based on the recovery plan that was presented to the Integration Joint Board in August being fully achieved. The Chief Officer of the Integration Joint Board will produce a further iteration of the recovery plan to include a range of options to bring the budget back into balance, and information in this will be included in the Council recovery plan that will be presented to members in early course. Members, at paragraph 22, we seek approval for a further draw from the Council's Innovation Fund with a request, a request of £11,200 by colleagues in the Ayrshire Roads Alliance to develop a digitalised works programme which aims to establish a fully digital end-to-end -end system to manage all aspects of the Roads Work programme. This digital change, which is supported by the Council's Digital Management Board, would result in the ability to process requests more efficiently and ultimately lead to lower costs. And approval is sought to allocate the funds from the remaining balance within the Innovation Fund, noting that payback into the fund would take place around within six months. At paragraph 25, we pick up information relating to the Council's capital programme, with additional costs noted in respect of the new escape stair at the Dower House, where costs have exceeded budget by around £5,000, and more importantly, noting that colleagues in facilities and property management are seeking approval to rephase the capital programme. Information provided within the table at paragraph 28 notes that in relation to the 24-25 general services capital budget, that this would be rephased from around £45.4 to £41.2 Members, the remaining sections of the report are covered in more detail in the accompanying report. And so, Chair, I'm happy to stop there and take any initial questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Colin. Quite a fluid situation there, but going in the right, the right direction, but it's uh, a big task there for us to address. Um, members, any, any questions? Liam? Just a comment on HBO Fuel. I know during the waste management review that they made the move for HVO, HVO to diesel, but there was a addition that they would monitor the price of it. It's just, maybe we can reflect that in the paper, the fact that if there is an opportunity and the price does reduce, that because there's no alterations to engines and the vehicles needed. So if we could somehow implement, put that in the paper somehow. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's obviously something that we would continue to monitor. Um, that obviously the uh, the price on the fuel and that, and if there was any reductions in that, we would factor that into sort of future considerations in relation to that. Certainly, make sure that's noted. Yeah. Okay. No one else. Right. Colin. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, the revenue section begins in page fourteen. Uh, Colin, the tables. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, Colin, sorry. Uh, apologies. Apologies to you too, Chair. Um, Chair, I think we are always now quite a way out from the pandemic, and I know we always take ourselves back to the pandemic. Could we have just an extra line to give an explanation as to why we are still referring back in relation to the pandemic? I know the answer to that, but I think it's important that we understand uh, that that pandemic still does have that long hand and stretches back into us and has an impact on what we're doing now today. 
Uh, yeah, certainly we can we can pick up on that. Obviously, the, there is reference to the pandemic, in particular in relation to health and social care, and the the, the increased um, care requirements and position that that has left going forward and is still continuing to be dealt with with services in there. But yeah, again, happy to sort of kind of pick up on that reference about the continuing impact that that has even at this point in time. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ronan. Okay, Colin. Thanks, Chair. Um, the revenue section begins on page 14. The tables have been changed slightly to take account of the work that is taking place in respect of the forthcoming recovery plans within relevant services. Within education, you can see continued pressures around both additional support for learning teaching costs, as well as the significant pressure in relation to additional support for learning transport. Moreover, the service highlights that the central budget held in respect of secondary and primary school absence cover will end the year significantly overspent as the Chief Education Officer provides additional financial support to head teachers to support temporary supply teachers to cover within schools. Within finance and ICT, governance and people and culture, we see underspends which will be used at the year end to support the council wide position overall and any individual service overspend positions. Members, you will recall that the previous East Ayrshire Performs report contained the recovery plan for communities and economy, and I believe, again, it's important to recognise the work that colleagues in these services have undertaken in recent months to bring the projected overspend back into balance. We see from today's report that communities and economies anticipate to the end the year in a break-even position should plans progress, but we also must recognise the pressures and challenges that remain within these services and the support that will be needed to provide sustained financial stability going forward. Within wellbeing, the report highlights an overspend of just under £7 million projected at this point in time. It notes that this is after the application of 1.6 million cost reductions based within the initial recovery plan that was produced some months ago. As noted earlier, the Chief Officer of the Integration Joint Board will produce a further iteration of that recovery plan in order to bring the overspend down further. On page 18, information in relation to the housing revenue account is shown. It shows that the HRA is anticipated to end the year around £400,000 underspent, with additional costs being offset by lower than anticipated debt charges. On page 20, the Council provides further detail and narrative around the Council initiatives that were approved by the Council in February 2024 as part of the budget. They show the allocation provided and the spend that is being incurred in the delivery of the initiatives, with information around half price school meals, clothing grants to three and four year olds, and additional works carried out to roads and pavements. Pupil Equity Fund information begins on page 22 and shows the allocation across our schools and the planned spend against the £4 million Pupil Equity Fund that was allocated by the Scottish Government. We know that the expenditure of around £1.8 million has already been incurred, with £2 million of planned spend anticipated to take place between now and the financial year end. The analysis also shows that some schools plan to carry forward around £175,000 of PEF between April and the end of the academic year in June next year. The Alternative Delivery Model section contains financial analysis of the Ayrshire Roads Alliance and the East Ayrshire Leisure Trust. It notes that ARA is anticipated to end the year overspent by around £1.3 million. The majority of this relates to spend within the local delivery element of the South Ayrshire Council due to higher costs in respect of street lighting, electricity, subcontractors and new IT systems. Within the strategic delivery element of the Alliance, we see an underspend of around £260,000, predominantly due to savings and staff costs. And within the local delivery element of East Ayrshire, we see an overspend of 450000 due to shortfalls in roads maintenance income, shortfalls in parking income, along with higher costs for street lighting, electricity, winter maintenance and consultancy costs. Page 26 and 27 contain details of the Ayrshire Roads Alliance capital section and include a range of information around roads maintenance and road slips, bridges works on the A71 and A735, alongside information on the new Cumnock flood scheme. In respect of the East Ayrshire Leisure Trust, we note a planned underspend of around about £10,000 at the year end. Information in relation to the Council's Treasury management arrangements are contained on page 30. They show the maturity profile of loan debt and information on our investments. At the time of the report, the Council had outstanding debt of around 40 
to what, £461 million. And notes that new borrowing of £55 million has taken place since the start of the financial year. It also notes that the Council had around £67 million of funds invested, with the majority of this placed with the Debt Management Office within HM Treasury. Chair, again, I'm happy to stop there before passing to, across to colleagues for the Capital, People and Health and Safety sections. That's Colin. Any questions so far? Elaine? Hey, thank you, Chair. Just a, a quick question about the alternative delivery models. On page 25, uh, the commentary for East Ayrshire, it mentions there's a winter maintenance cost, but I don't see a, a corresponding uh, cost in South Ayrshire, so I'm just wondering what, why there was a difference there. So winter maintenance cost for East Ayrshire is... Um, 193k, but there's nothing for South Asia. I can ask Jane, she's just behind you, Ellen. Thank yeah. you. Hi, um, through you, Chair Councillor Cowan. Um, so there would have been an increase in cost in South Ayrshire as well. I, I believe those increased costs are due to the cost of salt. So there would have been a comparable increase in cost in South Ayrshire as well. Not sure why that's not been drawn out as a, in the actual uh, wording there of the report, but I'm sure that that does exist in both areas. Okay. okay, can I maybe ask just another, uh, another question in terms of the road element? Just I know there's been a, a lot of uh, anxiety and issues about the essential work that we're having to do up the Irvine Valley between Gulfs and New Mills following the fatality. Uh, I believe there's an update in terms of uh, the restrictions. We've tried to minimise them where we can because I know the community, much the work needs to be done, but uh, can we have an update on that, Jane? Yeah, of course. Um, so the restrictions were going to be in place over a weekend as weekend closures through the working day, but that's been agreed with the contractor now that that's been changed to nighttime working. So the road closure will be over three working nights, and I believe that to be this coming Monday through to uh, Wednesday. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's helpful. Um, anyone else? Jim? Sorry. No, thanks, Chair. Colin, I wonder if you could maybe enlighten me a wee bit. Now, the recent announcement with increased uh, national insurance and employees, I've been told that would be fully funded, but my understanding as far as the housing revenue account, that might not be the case. Could you maybe just touch on that for me, please? Uh, yeah, certainly. Yes, well, obviously, we, um, following the budget, there has been an um, announcement of changes to national insurance increase, the rate, and in relation to the banding. Um, as it stands, um, um, we are obviously sort of kind of looking forward for looking for information coming forward to us um, on relation to the financial position that we'll have on the council at this moment in time. Going forward into next year, in terms of the budget, we are making the assumption that that will be fully funded. Um, but again, you're um, right to sort of make reference to the housing revenue account, which obviously is a ring-fenced fund, which finances it itself. So um, any uh, potential any changes there will have a potential impact on the employee costs within the housing revenue account. That's gone. So there is potential for it to have an impact on it. Yes. OK, thanks. Thank you very much. Could I ask a question, please, going back to the uh, Valley uh, in terms of is there an additional cost because we are spreading that work out over three nights uh, as opposed to how we had proposed to do that? Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, it's, uh, it's Jane. Something to, the, the, your hand does they seem to come up. I don't know if there's something wrong with the Computer morning, but we'll try and make sure that sits. I don't know. Uh, Jane. Yes, Councillor Mackay, um, the, the work's been let through our framework contract and there is a small uplift charge of 15% on some of the items for nighttime working that will, will be applied. So, yes, there is a, a slight increase in costs. Thanks. Yeah, I think, so I mean, having I think... access through the night is more important to us, I think, and putting that work over a shorter period of time, I think is perhaps more important. I, th I think we've had considerable concern for the, the business and the, the wider public about the inconvenience in terms of the detour. That I think in negotiations with the, the communities of the Irvine Valley, there seems to be a, a, you know, the additional expenditures trying to meet that concern. Uh, some kind of compromise. So, and I think that's just as a response to the, the, the communities in Irvine Valley. Yeah, that's some we'd want to be. 
Okay. Thank you. I'm very happy with tonight. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Maureen. Uh, just a, a, a smaller item, just to see the, the extension of the financial inclusion support. Nearly another million pounds of financial gains to some of our poorest families. I mean, that's uh, an incredible, an incredible result there, you know, in, in, in terms of getting money into people's pockets and, uh, you know, that just started getting into one particular uh, school campus and widened that out and that's really bringing money into people's pockets. And I'd just like to thank the staff for all their, all their work there, Colin, if you can pass that on. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I'm happy to carry on yeah, and yeah, then we come yeah. back to the capital and other sections. Yeah. Um, so I'll progress on in relation to the business briefing section. Uh, members' business briefings begin on page 48 and contain a number of performance indicators um, that services wish to draw your attention to. Within Chief Executive's information relating to benefits processing, planning applications and building warrants are noted within communities and economy. Information relating to tenancy, sustainability, void rent loss, housing rent arrears and bridge inspections is noted. Complaints begins on page 56. We note that 37 complaints were received within the period and nine were carried forward from quarter one. The improvement actions are as noted at the foot of page 56 and the time taken to respond to complaints is contained in the graph on page 57. Members, the corporate risk register begins on page um, uh, in the risk section. No new risks have been added to the register, nor have any risks changed their status at this time. The risk register was considered and reviewed by the council management team on the 24th of October. Chair, I'm happy to end there and um, pass forward to any colleagues for uh, the capital people and health and safety sections. Thanks. Uh, maybe bring the Chief Exec in first about the business uh, briefings. Uh, first, Colin, thanks. Uh, thanks, Leader, and I've already indicated this to corporate management team. Uh, I think the business briefings are, are helpful, you know, like for members, but as we enter into recovery plans, the significant recovery plans, I think we need to be clear that some of the business briefings are going to focus back round, you know, towards, you know, what progress are we making towards them within each of the individual services. So we'll have, we'll have conversations with members, you know, and with portfolio holders in particular around what are the particular things that we should be doing that actually shows progress towards some of these in terms of the business uh, briefings, you know, and make sure that it's, it's focused to things that are, you know, yes, they're the things that's important for, me for officers to tell you, but also things about that progress that we can evidence you know, that we're making progress against the uh, recovery plans. Right, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, I think that's where we need to, where we need to look. Uh, okay, uh, anyone anyone else? Okay, it's, uh, Graham. Thanks, Dougie. I, I raised it the last day. East just performed. It's about the, the tenants' arrears and then the switch over to universal credit and it's putting in arrears, and I've had contact with families that are in arrears for the first time due to the switchover and that six-week lead time. They were quite alarmed that the letter they received, and, and but I've not seen the, the word in the letter myself, but can we maybe a, a wee look at the wording within the letter to say the fact that we appreciate that people for the first time maybe have impacted with council arrears and that the support is there for them in, in giving that direction? Absolutely. You know that people are always you know, check their credit rate and things like that. There's obviously you know alarm just when they get some of these some of these letters. Claire, just to reiterate what uh, Graham said there. This was raised by myself as well about people going into technical debt, and I think we've got to keep a really close eye on this. And if we're having letters going out to them that are quite you know distressing as well, we're just adding to the the complication. Thank you. Okay, we'll certainly take that back and uh, see what we can see what we can do. We'll get back to members. Okay, um, Colin, is that just any capital next? Is yeah, that just to pass forward to Simon to take through the capital? Okay, yeah, Simon, if you want to take us through the capital report. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, good morning, members. Um, the capital program continues to face financial challenges uh, due to high construction costs and high interest rates and projects are being closely monitored to try and ensure essential scopes aligned with affordability caps. As usual, um, I'll not go through the report in great detail, but if I could highlight some key points for a selection of projects. 
um, starting with completed projects. Uh, with the SHIP programme development at Kennedy Drive and Kilmarnock, the first two phases of homes have now been handed over and the remaining two phases are due for completion by January next year. There's approximately £27 million of construction contracts currently on site, and that includes the St Sophia's Primary School Enerfit refurbishment and the Galston Library project. Um, both of these are progressing well and anticipated to complete spring of next year. Uh, we also have the demolition of the multi-storey car park, where works commenced in September and are due to be completed by April of next year. And moving to projects at a detailed design stage, these include the Cultural Kilmarnock project, where a favourable review of the projects now being completed by advisors engaged by the UK government. And the review will support the project adjustment request, which is due to be submitted to the UK government um, later in November, seeking an extension to the current March, March 2026 deadline. The design team and the preferred contractor have also commenced market testing for the works. Um, at Stuart Academy, designs for extension and refurbishment have been revised around about future growth projections and essential needs, and works also in progress with planning development colleagues to ensure that developer contributions are maximised where possible as a means of offsetting cost pressures associated with the project. Projects at the earlier stage of development include the Ayrshire Engineering Park and Ayrshire Manufacturing Investment Corridor at Moorfield as part of the Ayrshire Growth Deal, with an outline planning application for the master plan now submitted and design work progressing well. Discussions are ongoing with Scottish Power Energy Networks regarding costs associated with the electrical network upgrade. It's anticipated that Phase 1 site infrastructure works could commence uh, in spring of next year. At the Galleon Centre, works ongoing with the key stakeholders to develop a, an optimum procurement solution and scope of works for refurbishment and alteration of the facilities. And with the Doon Valley Community Campus, a range of surveys have been undertaken over the summer break to inform the development of a more detailed proposals, um, which are anticipated to be prepared for later this year, early next year. Uh, positive discussions are also ongoing with Scottish Futures Trust in relation to the previous LEAP2 funding and how the revised project may still be able to meet the funding criteria. Thanks, Chair. Happy to answer any questions on these or any others in the report. Thanks, Simon. Maybe can I, uh, page 33 in terms of the Kamark Town Centre regeneration of the bus station. I know there's been stuff in social media and elsewhere about uh, it's not the job's not completed yet. I understand there's still deep cleaning to do, and there's some issues still outstanding about signage and seating. I would just think it may be worthwhile to have a visit with elected members to, to have a look at the bus station before we finally sign it off. Certainly before we cut any ribbons or anything like that. Uh, but just to make sure uh, it's it's what, uh, what we're looking for. Uh, I think that may be a useful exercise. I see a lot of heads nodding there, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks to you. Happy to arrange a, um, a walk round. Um, we are kind of um, concluding the contract in terms of the contractual works just now. I think, as I've reported previously, there has been some delays associated with it um, in relation to additional work. There was steel, steel work supply issues, um, and there's also been some adverse weather, which has impacted progress. But on the positive, um, there's there's some cladding works that I know have still to be completed, and then there's a uh, resurfacing of the car park where the site accommodation is just now is the kind of last phase, and um, I'm advised that's that's due to be completed by 22nd of November. But as I say, happy to to arrange a walk round. Yeah, I think it'd be helpful just to kind of, uh, you know, just to give a bit of assurance to people, just uh, you know what's then, and to have a look at some improvement because that has been quite a quite a significant investment. So I uh, just want you to look at just how, it, how it's working and, uh, you know, want it safer and cleaner and tidier. Uh, so I, I think that'll be a worthwhile exercise. Um, Eddie? Leader, I'm just cognizant of the conversations that we'd had around the multi-storey car park site once the multi stories down. And just if we were going to have members walk around the, the bus station, it would be obviously opportune for us just to actually have a, a reality, because we've seen it in drawings rather than folk actually kind of point out what it would actually look like. Right. And as we're within a few feet of it, it, you know, it would seem opportune to actually just cover, you know, both the things if we're down there doing a member visit. Oh, absolutely, that'd be ideal. Uh, we'll get that arranged in the next few weeks or so. Okay. Uh, Maureen, yeah.
Hi, Maureen. Sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, I think we should be very happy that we have had the money confirmed uh, that we know is going to come to Kilmarnock. That I'm sure will give us a great boost going forward. And I just want to be grateful to everybody who has put any effort into uh, that work. I know it has been uh, ongoing and I know once there's a change of government, people are always anxious uh, as to what's actually going to happen. I think everybody has done very well that we actually have secured this project going forward. That's positive. It will benefit us all, uh, I'm quite sure. Uh, yes, I'm very pleased with the way things are progressing in relation to the bus station. I know that there are internal works actually taking place and I know that there is significant external commercial investment actually in the whole uh, profile of all sort of uh, bus issues uh, around Kilmarnock and that's something that's to be welcomed I think for all of us. So I do think that there are, even although things are very tight at the moment, I do think that we are still managing to make good things happen and I'm very uh, happy to have that walk round uh, when we expand up and we look at that wider area. I think that's a positive thing. Okay, th uh, thanks, Maureen. Yeah, uh, we'll look forward to that. I'd just like to thank the, the folk in terms of the, the town board. I know that they, 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 they put a bid in some, uh, you know, I think in front of many other uh, many other towns. Uh, and I think that was quite a, a big effort from the, the people in the, the town board and the, the chair and the rest of the folk in, involved. i uh, just like to express our thanks to them for, for doing such a good job. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Okay, the next bit is Amanda. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, members. The people pages uh, within the summary report start on page 36, with the statistics for absence being in page 37. For this period, there has been an increase in the number of employees absent and the number of days lost, which has resulted in an overall rise of 0.66 work days lost. The top five reasons for absence for 23, 24 and 24, 25 are noted and note, I would note that the top three have remained the exact same as the previous year with personal stress being first, musculoskeletal and then operations recovery. Page 39, 38 sorry, details occupational health activity. You will note a decrease in some of the appointments. This has been due to, as previously mentioned, we have a, been going through a transition period to our new occupational health provider and um, so there's been um, unfortunately the previous provider were not very helpful in that transition and um, so it's caused a, a few issues but we've got everything in place now and we're moving forward and feel as if we're on a positive footing with a new provider. In addition, within um, the absence section, I would also note that um, members agreed to monies to support additional capacity to support our services. So the recruitment process has been ongoing and we're now ready to launch that team, the support and attendance and wellbeing team next week. We're nearly fully um, staffed. We've still got one vacancy to fill. Their main priorities will be to focus on stress-related absences, musculoskeletal absences, but also review the early intervention and preventative supports that we have in place and a review in short-term persistent absence, also a focus on digitalising the processes. Disciplinary activity at the bottom of page 38 shows three still under consideration. Two of those have now been closed off, one resulting in a verbal warning, one with no further action, and the third will be closed off by the end of this week. Page 39, members will note that the head count um, compared to the same period last year is a decrease of 107. And on page 40, you'll see the Jobs and Training Fund as at the 30th of September, there were currently 101 young people in post, which is an increase from the previous of 14. We have uh, now fully committed the funding that was put aside for jobs and training for the three years, which will total in excess of 220 young people getting the opportunity. We have currently went out to um, heads of service for the council management team um, asking what their requirements would be should we be granted further funding going forward. 
Recruitment update is detailed at the bottom of page 40. We still continue to have hard to fill posts, particularly in health and social care. And we are concentrating on a hard push on the admin and clerical posts with um, supporting our apprentices to apply for these as appropriate. And page 41 details the number of employees leaving the council is 205, which is an increase from the previous period. These can be broken down into 66 retirements, 92 resignations and 40 ends of contracts. And then we've got a couple of other individual reasons. The payroll activity is detailed in page 41 and the communications overview is highlighted in page 42. It highlights the inquiries, activities and campaigns and notes the particular no particular trends emerging from um, inquiries over the period and work continues with excellent progress in our uh, website accessibility. And uh, page 42 and 43 notes the OD um, key performance areas and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Amanda. I think uh, page 40 in terms of the uh, we're ambitious for in terms of uh, apprenticeships and graduate uh, interns has, has been met over the last two years, and that's a great news story and some of the outcomes for folk uh, in terms of the qualifications and training that they've had uh, for our young people is, is great. And I know that we've uh, we've asked you to look at, in the, in the future, seeing if we can uh, extend that contract, uh, the, the 40 million point that we've got, and uh, if we can do that. So I think it might be worthwhile doing maybe a wee bit deeper analysis of you know, what's been successful and, and where we want to go in the future. Would be would be worthwhile. I don't know, Ed, if you want. Uh, thanks, Peter, and I think we'll see that detail coming back in the review of employability that we anticipate, you know, through Joe in December, uh, coming back to us. Uh, yes, looking at the council resources, uh, and also looking at some of the external resources that that come to us through Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, how that's been spent this year, how it might be spent in future years, uh, once we understand some of the detail uh, around that. But uh, we do see significant areas of our, our own internal business uh, that we think we can invest in, including some of the areas that we've maybe not directly done that in the past, like health and social care, etc. that there are opportunities to, to, to do that. So that definitely, you know, we would want to look at, as you requested as at a previous meeting, to look at our, you know, early intervention and prevention funds in terms of employability, but also need to look at where the current money is spent to make sure that that's focused in areas of our priorities too. I said, it. I, and it's just to look at you know the, a diverse approach to that, and I think I was really taken aback as I think I did the, the was it the president Coslar presidential team visit to SL sixty six, how transformational that, that has uh, has been that investment to some some of our uh, younger people and uh, people you know that probably wouldn't otherwise get the appropriate training that they need, uh, and it's absolutely transforming lives. Uh, so that's good to see, and hopefully, if we can continue that in some form, that'd be it'd be really good. Elaine, uh, thank you, Chair. It's just really building on that. Obviously, this is a really impressive result, and um, considering all the bleak news that's about at the moment, I, I don't think we do enough to sing our own praises when we get things right like this. So I'm just wondering, is there any way we can, you know, escalate this or, or promote it in a bit more? Um, if we've exhausted the, the current funding, this might be a, a good opportunity to do a case study on the, the journey we've gone, and that also would then lead into if there are any future opportunities with, with the new fund. I'm just think the, the timing would be good for a bit of good news for a change. Yeah, Eddie, I think that's absolutely worthwhile, and I think you know just that further work you know we really need to do as soon as we can just to inform that uh, choice, Eddie. I, I think absolutely we would uh, want to do that. We've got everything from the, the skills and learning teams and the, the huge success and the innovation that's seen, you know, that they're from across the country uh, that are seen is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I was in the chamber, uh, was it Friday I was in the chamber with 40 of our, you know, graduate, you know, like apprentices, you know, like coming through our um, foundation right through to graduate apprentices that, that, that were coming through right across all the services. And it was just fantastic, you know, it was just absolutely fantastic to see, uh, you know, like Coach Langham was, was clearly, you know, with me at that uh, and, and seeing the number of people that were actually coming through. 
and the real benefit to the council, this is not a one-way street, this is a massive benefit to the council that we're actually seeing uh, uh, coming through here. So, so, so yes, we can look at how we, we draw that together and, and promote that um, and, and think of it on the different levels uh, of the support to individuals, you know, the work in terms of addressing poverty, because let's not be, let's be absolutely clear that that's what we're doing in terms of that, and then going right through to the benefits to the council. So happy to do that. Maureen, sorry. Uh, again, I think it has been positive. I think there are more positives still to come in relation to that. And I'm quite interested in just getting just updated in terms of we're obviously working with private sector businesses as well. And just to get a sense of what successes we're actually having uh, with some of the placements that we're managing to do and some of the jobs that we're managing to grow within that area as well. So if we could just have perhaps a couple of sentences on that, Chief Exec, that would be a help. I agree, uh, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and and I know um, Chief Financial Officer, who's obviously leading the review of employability, um, has met with a number of different groups, and that's included the groups of people external to the council who are actually benefiting from some of our employability funds, and and the whole purpose of all that is to draw that all together uh, to bring back to yourselves as members for us to actually look at making sure that all our activity avoids duplication and is focused on our priorities uh, going going forward uh, for that. So happy to make sure that that's included in the report that Joe brings in December. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely look forward to that. Anyone else? Okay, um, David, now we have health and safety briefing. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Chair, and uh, good morning, members. The health and safety report covers page five and six. And if I could just begin by drawing members' attention to the top of page 45 of the summary report, we noted that there were 370 non-reportable incidents uh, through to the health and safety team, and that represents a reduction of 25 incidents in comparison to the same page last year. While well, incidents reported to HSE have also reduced slightly by one. If I could just draw members' attention to the key points at the top of page 45, at the bottom of that key point, you'll see uh, that one of those incidents reportable to HSE under uh, slips, trips and falls uh, was actually reported as a workplace fatality involving a service user in their own home. Um, well, it wouldn't be appropriate for me, Chair, to go through the specific detail of that accident here in public session. I can assure members that we've carried out a full and thorough investigation into that accident, and that's uh, the report that's currently um, in the hands of the management team in health and social care. I can also confirm that health and safety executive are at the initial stages of carrying out their own investigation, and we're currently supporting colleagues uh, as that progresses, Chair. If we can move more broadly back to the decrease in non-reportable incidents, that's mainly attributable to a decrease in the number of violence and aggression incidents within educational establishments, which if you look at the bottom of the page, um, you see has went down by 63 incidents in comparison to the same periods last year. That's slightly offset by a, a slight increase in the number of incidents of violence and aggression in non-educational establishments. Um, but however, however, that is a welcome trend for, for the usual report of these incidents going up the way. Moving on to the number of days to report incidents to health and safety, that's reduced from three days to 2.7 days and still within the five-day target. And finally, Chair, in order to ensure safety compliance across Council's higher risk activities, there were 623 unannounced inspections carried out over the reporting period, which is a healthy number of, of unannounced inspections. And these continue to support the Council, uh, maintaining a good safety culture across its higher risk activities. I'd be happy to take any questions, Chair. Thanks, David. Any questions for David? Comment? OK, uh, thanks, that, David. So, uh, Colin, do you just want to conclude? The report. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, just to sort of kind of conclude the report, that's that's the Easter show performs for a quarter two. So it's just if there are any further questions at this point. Okay, I think nothing further ado to agree the recommendations. Can we agree the recommendations? Okay, thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, okay, now we go to the 
What's end of the E items? We'll allow our education folk a couple of minutes to excuse himself. Okay, and now going to the command at Christmas parking arrangements uh, over to Jane. Thank you, Chair. This report provides an update to Cabinet on the effectiveness of the December 2023 Christmas parking arrangements in Kilmarnock and recommends that Cabinet agrees to the implementation of the same parking offer during December 2024. The 2023 arrangements allowed for free parking in all on and off street locations in Kilmarnock after 2pm throughout the month of December. During this time, manual vehicle counts and observations were undertaken that showed that both on and off street car parks were noticeably busier than usual, with few free bays available. However, the desired turnover of spaces was also preserved. It's not possible to determine whether this increased level of parking was attributed to the free parking offered or was simply down to the traditional pre-Christmas increase in retail activity. The financial impact of last year's arrangement on parking income was also assessed and it was found to have resulted in a drop in income of approximately £30,000 compared with that in the previous month. This year, that would be offset to some extent by the increased income from the charges now applied during Saturday mornings within the off-street car parks. The opinion of businesses regarding last year's arrangement was gathered through a survey conducted earlier this year, and the results are shown in Appendix 1 to this report. These show that, for the most part, participants would be keen to see a similar arrangement offered this year. Given that last year's arrangement was successful in terms of providing cheaper parking whilst ensuring the turnover of spaces, it is recommended that the offer of free parking after 2pm during December is repeated again this year. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any, any questions? Lynn. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just, just two points, and, and Jane will be relieved they're not really directed at her. Um, as part of the Command Strategic Group, I know we've spoken in the past about having some kind of timetable events in the town. And obviously, this paper is to attract people into town during the festive period. Um, so I, th I think it'd be useful if we could get some progress update on where we are with that events timetable. Because it's not just about parking and cars, it's about encouraging people into the town to spend their time and to help with the local economy. So it'd be useful to have um, an update on where we are with that. Um, and the second point is about the, the feedback that's there. I, I mean, I appreciate it's only a snapshot, but it's a very relatively low number of businesses that, that responded. Um, yesterday, we had a, a session with the corporate support team um, and we were discussing and looking at the, the council's data and analytics strategy. I'm actually wondering if there's maybe an opportunity to do something different next year, um, like assess the, the, the car parking and the car usage in the town by using some other da uh, data analytics um, and perhaps that, that team could support um, that work. So just a suggestion. Thank you. I think uh, when we can take on board, Rich. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Leader, and uh, thanks, Councillor Cowan, on both points. Uh, I'll have a conversation with Annika in terms of the timetable of events and uh, and make sure we we, uh, we bring that forward for members' consideration. And absolutely, if there's a way of uh, engaging colleagues in terms of their uh, expertise and uh, that would result in a, a greater response, then we'll, we'll we'll take that forward as well. So happy to to, to move forward on both, Leader. So yeah, uh, look forward to that. Anyone else? Okay, again, can we agree the recommendations? Okay, and item four, um, it's LDP2, Draft Design Supplementary Guidance. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, Leader. I'll uh, talk you through this report fairly briefly. Um, the report before you today is seeking authority to publish for consultation draft supplementary guidance on design and placemaking. As set out in paragraph three and four of the report, members will be aware that we adopted Local Development Plan 2 in April of this year. And since then, we've been working hard to produce supplementary guidance to support the plan, which as noted in paragraph three, can be given equal weight in decision making to the plan itself. 
So over the last few months, we've presented to you at Cabinet eight new pieces of statutory supplementary guidance, which we've then moved forward to consultation and adoption. These are now being used to help deliver the policies of the plan. So today, the guidance we're asking you to approve focuses on good design and placemaking. As described in paragraphs five to six of the report, a vital part of LDP2 and indeed National Planning Framework 4 is to raise the quality of development and create places that put people and communities first. As planners, it's an issue that we feel strongly about that by creating better places that are well connected, have good access to open space and are enjoyable places to be, we can really help to improve quality of life and well-being. So the draft supplementary guidance itself has been placed in the members portal. Um, it's a big document. It's made up of five distinct sections. And whilst the sections complement each other, they can be read as standalone documents. So not all will be relevant to all development proposals. Section seven of the report just summarises each of the sections. Um, so just to outline what these are without going into too much detail. Section one of the guidance sets out the key design principles that we will expect all developers to consider and demonstrate. It sets out at the outset that good design and placemaking will be a fundamental consideration in determining planning applications in East Ayrshire. And it calls for early collaboration between developers and the planning authority, recognising that any problems or issues with design can be more easily resolved earlier in the planning process that we are. Appendix 2 tackles green and blue infrastructure. This is a really important element of the guidance. Um, green infrastructure or open space should be provided in new places, but it should not just be a tick box exercise to meet the policy thresholds. The guidance requires good quality, usable open space that benefits both residents and nature. Appendix 2 provides guidance for householders on amendments they may be thinking about making to their houses, such as extensions, outbuildings, etc. So it's much more about smaller scale developments. Um, this is important to make sure that householders know what they can do um, with some knowledge of what will be supported by the planning authority. And it will reduce the chance of impacting negatively on neighbouring properties and the wider residential area. Appendix 3 is shopfront guidance, and it's really a refresh of previous LDP1 guidance that we had. Um, it recognises the impact that good and bad shopfronts can have on creating welcoming town centres and commercial areas. And finally, Appendix 4 of the guidance provides uh, guidance on adverts, helping to ensure that all adverts proposed meet legislative and best practice requirements. And there are just a couple of other parts of the report that I particularly want to draw attention to. In terms of process, paragraph 8 outlines that if Cabinet approves the document, we will consult on it before submitting to Scottish ministers for final sign-off. A recent experience has been that ministers have not intervened with any of our pieces of supplementary guidance, allowing us to proceed straight to adoption. And we would expect this to be the case with this one as well. As per the recommendation, we would return to Cabinet um, if the consultation feedback return results in substantive changes to the document, or indeed ministers do request changes. Finally, but importantly, paragraph 15 under risk implications confirms that there is a time constraint to adopting this guidance. Legislation sets a March 2025 cutoff for the adoption of any statutory guidance and government officials have requested that we, if we can, submit all guidance to them by the end of this calendar year, so by the end of December. Um, this is still achievable with this guidance, just however any delay to this consultation commencing will impact on this. Um, in any case, we will work closely with our government colleagues in terms of the timescales and submission to them. So just to finish up, I'll just refer you back to the recommendations at paragraph two, which are essentially to approve the draft guidance for public consultation, to authorise our chief planner to make any minor editorial changes prior to consultation and after consultation on the basis that these are not substantive changes. To then proceed with adoption procedures following consultation, again, on the basis that there's no intervention made by ministers and to otherwise note the contents of this report. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments on it. Thanks, Alison. Uh, thanks for that report. Members, any uh, clear? Thanks. Just a quick question on the um, the appendix three on the shop fronts. Is that retail only? Because there's some businesses, and I really don't want to mention any of them because it's a public forum, but they have some quite unsympathetic and large um, signage. So, but they're a business, not a retailer. Thank you. There is quite a blight of them. We used to be, I remember back in the day, 
Uh, we used to be quite strict with we, we, we terms of signage, uh, uh, maybe o o overly, but uh, nowadays some of the signage is just kind of garish, uh, just uh, there's really nothing for the, the high street or anywhere else. Uh, Pamela or, or Alison? Um, yeah, so certainly the, the shop... The, the two appendices are quite similar, the short front and then the advertising one. So certainly the advertising one, the last one, is aimed at any kind of adverts um, about how we should be looking at adverts. The short front one, um, it doesn't need to just be what we think of as traditional retail. So it could be other commercial businesses within town centres that have a, a short front kind of appearance, I suppose. I think, I'm thinking barber or something. <laughs> I'm not... I'm, I'll leave it at that. Uh, OK, uh, members, any other comments? Or... Right. Uh, can we agree the recommendations? OK. And we'll go to item five now, and that's the uh, Chief Officer's Local Government Employees Craft Operators Local Government Pension Scheme Employers Discretions. Amanda. Thanks, Chair. The purpose of this report is to confirm the position to Cabinet and the Council's statement of policy for the, of employers' discretions for the local government pension scheme. The background is laid out in paragraphs 3 through to 9, which notes the regulatory requirements that the Council must keep under review the statement of policy, and a copy of that is attached to Appendix 1. The reviewed position is that um, we have carried out a review of the employer's statement from 2023 and are recommending no changes. The implications are those of governance only and the updated statement um, will ensure that the Council continues to meet its legislative requirements as an employer. The recommendations are in paragraph two, which is to note the contents of the report and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Any questions for Amanda on that? OK, can we agree recommendations? OK, and uh, now go to exclusion of uh, press and public. I'll move exclusion of press and public. 